Good morning, and welcome to the Enbridge third quarter 2024 financial results conference call. My name is Rebecca Morley, and I'm the Vice President of Investor Relations. Joining me this morning are Greg Ebel, President and CEO, Pat Murray, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, and the heads of each of our business units, Colin Grunding, Liquid Pipeline, Cynthia Hansen, Gas Transmission and Midstream, Michelle Heritage, Gas Distribution and Storage, and Matthew Ackman, Renewable Power. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Following the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session for the investment community. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press the pound key. Note that this conference is being recorded. As per usual, the call is being webcast and I encourage those listening on the phone to follow along with supporting slides. We'll try to keep the call to roughly one hour and in order to answer as many questions as possible, we'll be limiting questions to one plus a single follow-up if necessary. We'll be prioritizing questions from the investment community. So if you're a member of the media, please direct your inquiries to our communications team, who will be happy to help you. As always, our investor relations team will be available following the call for any follow-up questions. On slide two, where I'll remind you that we'll be referring to forward-looking information on today's presentation and Q&A. By its nature, this information contains forecast assumptions and expectations about future outcomes, which are subject to the risks and uncertainties outlined here and discussed more fully in our public disclosure file. We'll also be referring to non-GAAP measures summarized below. And with that, I'll turn it over to Greg Ebel. Well, thank you, Rebecca, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on the call today, and I'm pleased to be here to recap another strong quarter. Before I get into the quarterly update, I want to acknowledge everyone affected by the devastating impact caused by Hurricane Helene and Milton. We extend our sympathies to our partners, our customers, and the communities impacted and wish to reiterate Enbridge's commitment to support you during this challenging time. While we've seen limited interruption of our operations and no material financial impact, safety remains our number one priority in ensuring communities have the safe and reliable energy necessary for everyday activities. Now on to the quarter. I'm going to start by sharing some highlights for Q3. Then I'd like to spend a minute or so highlighting Enbridge's value proposition and how we are positioned to return capital to shareholders in all market cycles. I'll then review how Enbridge is ideally situated to serve increasing gas demand stemming from data centers, electric power, LNG, coal retirement, and industrial growth. I'll also provide updates from our business units before turning it over to Pat. Pat will walk you through our third quarter results, key drivers supporting our reaffirmed financial outlook and our capital allocation priorities. I will then close with a few key messages and highlight some important events coming up on the calendar. Following our presentation, the Enbridge management team will be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Throughout the third quarter, our assets again experienced continued strong utilization across the business, which drove solid financial results. We are well positioned to deliver full year results near the top end of our EBITDA guidance. On DCF per share, we continue to expect to be near the midpoint of the range, despite fully pre-funding the utilities acquisitions before their closing. Our leverage is within our target range of four and a half to five times Debt to EBITDA after closing PFNC, and we expect to trend down over the next few quarters. With the acquisitions closed and the funding completed, we have successfully concluded the acquisition of three U.S. gas utilities, which perfectly fit Enbridge's low risk business model, and so we have returned to an equity self funded model. This has been a well executed major transaction that investors will benefit from for years to come. In liquids, we closed the previously announced acquisition of additional docks and land adjacent to our state-of-the-art crude export facility at Ingleside. We continue to see high utilization and expect to unlock future growth opportunities there. Across the businesses, we're on track to place $5 billion of secured capital into service in 2024. On growth, the team has done a great job, and I'm pleased to highlight four new creative investments 
inroad in gas transmission. We further executed our Permian strategy by acquiring a 15% interest in the highly contracted DBR gathering system. The assets enhance our natural gas value chain and serve as a key feeder system for the Whistler pipeline. In renewable power, we sanctioned Sequoia Solar, an up to 815 megawatt project in Texas. Sequoia is backed by long-term PPAs with AT&T and Toyota for the vast majority of production. We're also excited to announce participation in the third and final phase of Fox Squirrel Solar, following a successful completion of the second phase during the quarter. In gas transmission, we also sanctioned offshore oil and gas pipelines to serve BP's new deep water U.S. Gulf of Mexico development. All in all, we've added $7 billion to our secured growth program so far this year. As you can see, our scale and connectivity continue to provide competitive advantages in sanctioning new opportunities. This growth in our business continues to underpin our stable and growing dividend. At Enbridge, we have built a low-risk business that is designed to succeed in all market cycles. This is how we've been able to deliver growing dividends for 29 years, making us one of the very few dividend aristocrats. Looking longer term, we expect to steadily grow the business by 5% annually, and will remain financially disciplined to support sustainably returning capital to shareholders. Enbridge offers an attractive dividend yield, which sits above the return of many alternative investments. The Canadian and U.S. 10-year treasuries are sitting at about 3 and 4% respectively, while broad equity indices like the TSX 60 and the S&P 500 are at approximately 3 and 1% respectively. It's worth noting key drivers that enable us to be considered a dividend aristocrat and underpin that 29 years of dividend growth. Our highly contracted cash flows experience minimal volatility, allowing us to predictably pay and grow the dividend. Investment grade credit ratings across the four major rating agencies highlight the strength of our balance sheet and the low risk nature of our businesses. We have negligible commodity price exposure, which sets us apart from many of our midstream peers. And in on EBITDA growth, we expect that to be higher through the next few years at 7 to 9% due to base business performance, new assets entering service, tucking in M&A, and contributions from the acquired utility. Enbridge outpaces Canadian large peers by making up approximately 10% of the total dividends paid by the TSX 60 companies today. All told, our business is designed to succeed in all market cycles and deliver predictable results. Despite a volatile world, Enbridge is seeing increased visibility of our long-term growth, supported by strong energy infrastructure fundamentals, and in particular, rising power demand. Enbridge is well-positioned to serve increased gas and power demand over the next decade. S&P is forecasting up to 20 BCF per day of incremental gas demand, growth by 2030. We are ideally situated to participate in new growth opportunities related to this increased demand. Our gas footprint is within 50 miles of approximately 45% of all gas fire generation in North America today. Importantly for investors today, we are already sanctioning additional growth opportunities to support natural gas power demand, like our Tennessee Ridgeline project, where we're investing $1.1 billion U.S. to expand our East Tennessee pipeline to support TVA's planned retirement of nine coal-fired units in favor of 1.5 gigawatts of gas-fired generation. Our utilities are situated in high-growth power markets, with North Carolina being a top destination for onshoring due to its affordable power and favorable corporate tax rates. In that regard, Enbridge Gas North Carolina is investing $600 million U.S to expand our gas lines to serve Duke's Roxborough Gas Fire Generation Plant, which will have capacity of at least 1.4 gigawatts. We expect that project to be completed in 2027. We also have exciting developments within our renewable segment with over 2 gigawatts in development or under construction across the U.S. Beyond the electric power sector, we own over 620 BCF of strategically located natural gas storage, and this position is growing. Our port 
portfolio represents 25% of U.S. Gulf Coast deliverability, and we own the only underground natural gas storage facility in British Columbia, which provides essential flexibility for Canadian LNG operations. Of course, our Great Lakes storage position of 300 BCF at dawn is a critical hub for North American natural gas users like power generators and utilities, and continues to expand each year. Dawn represents over 20% of deliverability in the region. On the LNG front, our pipelines are strategically connected to more than 30% of existing and announced LNG export capacity and will continue to serve global demand growth. We also have a preferred interest in wood fiber LNG, which is expected to be the world's first net zero export facility through utilizing hydropower and is expected to produce 2.1 million tons per annum. Now let's jump into the exciting updates in each of the business units, starting with liquids. Mainline is on track to exceed our full year forecast of 3 million barrels per day. The system was an apportionment in July and August, and we continue to see strong customer demand, evidenced by the fact that the main line is back in apportionment for November. We're advancing discussions with customers for additional Western Canadian sedimentary basin pipeline capacity in 2026 and beyond. You should think of these as brownfield opportunities that would be very capital efficient and provide customers with critical insurance egress to deliver barrels to downstream markets. As producers grow into available egress out of Western Canada, we've also recently started advancing a number of capital efficient low multiple expansion opportunities on our regional oil sands pipes. In the Permian, we continue to see strong volumes this quarter. At Ingleside, we set a single day volume record of 2.6 million barrels and a monthly average record of 1.2 million barrels per day. It's noteworthy. Ingleside recently hit 3 billion, with a B, barrels of volumes exported, underscoring the competitive advantage of the facility and strong customer demand that attracted us to the purchase of the facility in 2021. We are seeing continued growth there, with 2.5 million barrels of storage under construction with in-service expected in 2025. We also closed the acquisition of new docks and adjacent lands at Ingleside, which will provide further growth opportunities and allow us to optimize existing dock capacity. Work is already underway to integrate these new assets. And now let's look a little bit deeper at our gas transmission business. I'm excited to highlight how we are connecting new supply to key demand centers and extending our Permian natural gas value chain. We thank you close to a billion dollars in offshore pipelines during to serve BP's new deep water development plans in the Gulf. These pipelines strengthen and diversify our offshore business while expanding our footprint in the region. Backed by long-term contracts with in-service expected in 2029, adding secured capital to our backlog at the end of the decade. We acquired a 15% interest in the DVR system. It extends our natural gas value chain and further demonstrates strategic value and growth opportunities being unlocked through the Whistler JV we announced earlier this year. As a reminder, we also previously announced sanctioning the Black Cone Pipeline, which will add up to 2.5 billion cubic feet per day of egress for our Permian customers and serve growing natural gas demand in the area in 2026. We are progressing a development of 6.5 BCF expansion at our Trace Palacios gas storage which we acquired in early 2023 at an attractive price. Demand for recontracting continues to increase, and since acquisition, rates have about doubled for the strategically located asset, providing accretion beyond our original model expectations. The Venice Extension Project, which serves Venture Global's Blackman's LNG export facility, is now flowing gas, and we expect it to be fully in service by year end. So now let's move on to our gas distribution segment. As I mentioned earlier, we have now welcomed all three U.S. gas utilities into Enbridge, and I couldn't be more proud of the team's dedication and commitment to execution. We are now the largest natural gas utility in North America, delivering over 9 billion cubic feet per day and serving approximately 7 million customers. The team has been hard at work integrating each of the utilities, and we expect that to continue in the months ahead. 
but there are four utilities now in-house. I thought I'd spend a minute highlighting the key growth drivers across the franchise. In Ontario, we expect new customer hookups and additional power generation to drive growth, including new investment in storage and transmission. The utility has a strong track record of predictable growth and consistent returns. The Ontario government just released their long-term vision for the province's energy industry and future in response to the ISO's updated demand forecast, which predicts a 75% increase in electricity demand by 2050. We are pleased to see the Minister of Energy acknowledging the vital role natural gas plays in Ontario's first integrated energy resource plan to ensure customer affordability and reliability across industrial, residential, commercial, and agricultural sectors. In combination with the ISO's forecast, we believe that Enbridge Gas Ontario is primed to benefit from major tailwinds of gas demand. The province is procuring up to 1,300 megawatts of new gas fire generation and have reported that there are over 7,000 megawatts of data center interconnection inquiries across more than 30 unique sites. In Ohio, Growth will largely be driven by pipeline replacement, modernization, and system enhancement under programs such as the Pipeline Infrastructure Replacement Plan. Over 80% of capital spent in Ohio is expected to be quick cycle under these rider programs and provide attractive risk-adjusted returns. That said, we are also evaluating opportunities to serve new demand related to data centers and natural gas power plant expansion. Growth in Enbridge Gas Utah will be driven by increased population, new data center power demand, and modernization of the system. We're excited about the data center opportunities we're seeing there so far. We've recently contracted supply to serve 200 megawatts of power for data centers and are evaluating inquiries for another 600 megawatts. Finally, Enbridge Gas North Carolina has a very healthy population growth and will be expanding to serve Duke's 1.4 1.4 gigawatt Roxborough gas fire generation plant, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, and constructing a 2 BCF LNG facility for system reliability. North Carolina is also opportunity rich as the state is positioned to be one of the primary beneficiaries of industrial growth from onshoring and manufacturing in the region. Overall, we see an average of 8% annual rate based growth across our U.S. gas utilities over the coming years. Now let's turn to the renewables business. Our strategic and disciplined approach has resulted in sanctioning additional growth with blue chip partners. We're excited to announce that we've completed phase two of Fox Squirrel Solar Project. Phase three is under construction and is expected to be in service by year end. Consistent with the other phases, phase three is backed by a long-term PPA with Amazon for 100% of the energy production. We also sanctioned the approximately 800 megawatt Sequoia Solar Project in Texas with a staggered in-service date expected 25 and 26. This will be one of the largest solar facilities in North America by capacity and is backed by long-term PPAs with AT&T and Toyota for substantially all of the production. This marks further execution on the opportunities laid out at Investor Day as we develop two gigawatts of renewable projects in service dates by the end of 2026. Our customer relationships and disciplined track record development and contracting should allow us to continue delivering solid growth in this segment with strong risk-adjusted returns. With this, I'll turn it over to Pat to discuss our third quarter financial results. Thanks, Greg, and welcome, everyone. Continued strong demand across our asset base drove record third quarter EBITDA and we are in DCF per share of $1.19, which includes the impact of pre-funding of the U.S. gas utilities. Liquid EBITDA is up year over year, primarily due to the first of our annual OPEX inflation and power cost escalators, which increased the mainline toll. As a reminder, these take effect on July 1st of each year. Our gas transmission business is up compared to last year, despite the sale of our interest in Alliance and Oxable. This is driven by the acquisition of Tomorrow RNG, the 19% interest in the Worcester joint venture, and our gas storage assets outperforming. We continue to see solid demand for our gas storage and benefit from elevated rates in the contracts we entered into since last year. I'm also happy to announce that we once again 
have recontracted 100% of our GPM Evergreen contracts, illustrating the high demand for these great assets. Our gas distribution business includes a full quarter of EBITDA from both Enbridge Gas Ohio and Enbridge Gas Utah, which drove the majority of the step up in 2023. Our renewables business earned development fees in the third quarter of 2023, which can't be lumpy, and their absence this quarter is driving the decrease year over year. Below the line, we have higher maintenance capital from the U.S. gas utility acquisitions, as well as higher interest expense and weighted average shares from the associated pre-funding of those same U.S. gas utilities. All in all, our third quarterly results have set us up to achieve our guidance range for the 19th consecutive year. Let's dive a little deeper into that guidance. As a reminder, we recast our financial guidance in the second quarter to include the U.S. gas utilities, and I'm pleased to reaffirm those ranges for both adjusted EBITDA and DCF per share. In fact, we expect to close 2024 with another quarter of strong operating performance, which would push Enbridge near the top of our EBITDA guidance range. For DCF per share, we expect to finish the year around the midpoint of guidance, which is a great outcome when you consider the pre-funding of the utility acquisition we did this year while not benefiting from a full year of EBITDA. Looking ahead, full year utility contribution, coupled with continued operational excellence and in-footprint initiatives should drive growth over the near and medium term. Our balance and diversified secured backlog sits at $27 billion today, and we expect to place approximately $5 billion of that into service by the end of 2024. Those projects are expected to drive new EBITDA and underpin our near-term growth commitments through 2026. Now let's turn to our capital allocation priorities. Our capital allocation philosophy is guided by our financial guardrails, which remain firmly in place. Our target leverage of four and a half to five times, the sweet spot for Enbridge, and the DCF payout of 60 to 70 percent aligns with our cash flow oriented view of the business. We're proud of our dividend aristocrat status, it's become a hallmark of our value proposition, and growing our dividend annually is a key consideration when deploying our eight to nine billion of annual growth investment capacity. For the next few years, we've earmarked approximately six to seven billion in the form of low capital intensity expansion, modernization capital, and rate based investment. The remaining two to three billion of investment capacity can be opportunistically deployed either into new and creative organic projects, tuck ins, or debt reduction. Within that framework, we capitalize on the best available opportunities with our equity self funding model. Our outlook and growth will continue to revolve around low risk, long life investments that support rateable dividend increases. I want to again thank the teams for the hard work this quarter, bringing in the last of the LDCs and ensuring another great operational and financial showing here at Enbridge. With that, I'll pass it back to Greg to finish off the presentation. Thanks very much, Pat. Enbridge continues to be positioned to succeed in all market conditions with a low risk business model and visible growth outlook. The scale and diversification of our business is driving key competitive advantages across complementary business franchises. Our businesses are already in front of and will continue to be in front of dramatic secular changes in power demand, both gas and renewables. Reindustrialization in the key jurisdictions we serve in North America and, of course, growing energy exports from North America. Our industry-leading asset footprint and solid track record of execution has allowed us to take advantage of attractive growth opportunities to meet rising global demand for energy. Returning capital to shareholders through a sustainable and growing dividend continues to be a core pillar of our value proposition and positions us as a first choice investment opportunity. Now, before I turn it over to the operator for questions, I'd like to share the dates of some exciting events coming up on the calendar. We expect to issue a news release with our 2025 financial guidance on December 3rd, 2024. And then on March 4th, 2025, we will be hosting our annual investor day in New York. And we hope that you can all join us in person. With that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. And operator, please open the lines for questions. Stand by while we prepare for the question and answer session. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad to raise your hand and join the queue. If you would like to withdraw your question, simply press star 1 again. 
Your first question comes from the line of Jeremy Tonnette from J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Morning. Um, just want to start off, I guess, uh, you know, looking down the future, you outlined some of the uh, expansion potential for the main line, but it seems like uh, we've filled up pretty quick here. Just wondering, I guess, what's possible on the egress front down the road as uh, it seems like producers are eager to fill any space you can provide. Hey, good morning, Jeremy. It's Colin. Yeah, I think your your read is right on this. Uh, production is is ramping uh, nicely, and yeah, we're back into apportionment here in November. I don't expect us to be in apportionment every month going forward here, but seasonally, I think you're going to see uh, a lot of demand for the main line. Uh, and we have commenced uh, commercial discussions with industry. We spent the quarter engineering. Um, the expansion. It's really more of an optimization, I think. It's not a, a trenching or a new path. It's in in the right of way, in in, in terminals, um, and and quite executable. So uh, I'd say uh, early response from industry is is quite positive for obvious reason, as Greg said in his remarks. Um, and I think, as everybody knows, the last barrel uh, egress prices all 5 million barrels in the basin. So it's very uh, economically important that the basin is not constrained. So we're continuing to develop that. Uh, I'd say it's trending the right direction. And um, I don't think we have any capital cost estimates for you at this point. Got to refine those a little bit. But uh, looking at uh, in-service dates in uh, late 26, 27. The other nice thing I'd add to that, Jeremy, is that there'll be uh very solid from a multiple perspective, a build multiple perspective, which obviously means the returns will be uh, very satisfactory for both us and investors. That's great to hear. Thank you for that. And then pivoting to the LDC side, now that Enbridge is the largest uh, natural gas LDC in North America that we can tell, um, just wondering how you think about future growth here. Uh, obviously, a lot of organic initiatives uh, that are, are, can be had on your existing platform, but we also see some other LDC assets on the block out there for sale. Um, how do you think about organic versus inorganic growth uh, going forward? Hey, just to start, Jeremy, thanks for the question. Uh, Michelle's here, so I'll let her uh, go at that. In terms of other LDCs, look, we, uh, we've made some uh, big purchases here with three of what we think are the best ones out there. So I would say our focus is very much on integration of these three, not looking at other LDCs at, uh, at this point in time. Uh, but in terms of the growth, maybe I'll turn it over to Michelle. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jeremy. So first, I think what I have to have to say now, being able to really look under the hood of these beyond what we did through the due diligence period is, these are every bit as good as we thought what they were in terms of the utilities. They're just excellent utilities in great jurisdictions that really are focused on the uh, access to affordable energy, driving their economic growth. And that's, uh, that, that means that we're, they're really well positioned for growth. Uh, certainly, Greg outlined the, the different ways that we see them growing in terms of population growth super strong in places like Utah and North Carolina. A uh, strong modernization program with quick capital uh, in Ohio. Uh, I think we also talked about our, our uh, projects that we have going on in North Carolina. I'd say all of those we knew as we went in. The big thing that's come up in the in the last year that really didn't factor in is the data center growth that we're seeing, and that's coming across the board. I mean, we I think last quarter we mentioned 50 megawatts we had signed up in Utah, that's at the, or at least the gas to, to produce that 50 megawatts, and that's been increased to about another 200 megawatts in terms of the gas to uh, to produce that. And lots of inquiries along that. They call it the Wasatch Front, so that Salt Lake, Provo area. Similarly, North Carolina, big decarbonization program from Duke, lots of, lots of data centers going into that Raleigh tech hub. And even in Ohio, where we thought it was a little further, out, we're just seeing that demand for power. And then, of course, in our original utility in Ontario, as Greg mentioned, 75% growth by 2050, a government that, and a minister of energy that's very clear about the need for all of the above when it comes to energy and the need for natural gas as meeting part of the generation that they're looking for from the what's been the largest ever procurement in the Ontario ISS history. So we're feeling very good about that growth. 
Yeah, just so Jeremy, the only other thing I'd add is that at 8% rate base growth we talked about a year ago, remember that did not take into account, we didn't have knowledge or good insight into some of the benefits we're seeing from data centers, power growth, reindustrialization, reshoring. So obviously I'll be looking for Michelle and the team to uh, even do better than what we originally thought. Got it. That's good to hear. Thank you. Thanks. Your next question comes from a line of Robert Catelier from CIBC. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, everyone. I, I'd like to start with the uh, rate of capital deployment into onshore renewables, particularly in the U.S. Um, we've accomplished a lot uh, in a short period of time, but I'm wondering how much is uh, capital is needed to be deployed to uh, meaningfully bridge the gap between EBITDA and the DCF per share growth rate, understanding that these investments uh, stand on their own merits and not just uh, for the tax attributes. Yeah, thanks, Rob. It's Matthew. Um, we're really, really pleased with our progress, as you noted, on the onshore, and I, I think our pivot there is really paying off. We've got a lot of great projects. And as I said at Investor Day, um, especially in solar, there's this rich seam here where uh, panel prices went down quite a lot. And so companies like ours that had interconnection agreements, ready to go projects, are capitalizing on the very high demand out there, you know, not only from data centers, but all kinds of blue chip corporates. As, as you see here, we got AT&T and Toyota in, uh, in the Sequoia project. And there's lots of great data center conversations going on, as you can imagine. So, you know, we're really able to capitalize on that and achieve returns, frankly, above what we even expected on these. We're talking like mid-teens type returns, um, very, you know, solidly accretive right out of the chute, uh, quick cycle capital on these. You know, we're, we're going to be bringing these in service uh, starting in next year. Um, so we're not tying up a lot of capital for a long period. Um, so, look, this is, this is really beneficial across the board. And we got a good pipeline behind this. We've probably got another couple of gigawatts here anyway that we can uh, roll out into the strong demand and strong return environment. Robert, I wouldn't, it's Greg, I wouldn't uh, downplay the tax benefits too, right? I mean, that does get to your per share metrics. So everything that Matthew said is bang on. Uh, but, uh, you know, we look at it from both from an EBITDA perspective, but obviously the bottom line impact as well, right? That's yeah, that's what. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. It seems like there's an opportunity to bridge the gap between your lower DCF per share um, outlook and uh, what you have on the EBITDA on the APS front. But uh, the second question I had is um, maybe for Colin. We've been hearing, reading media reports about uh, potential additional asset sales to Indigenous groups, and I wondered if there was uh, any update you had for us there. Yeah, thanks, Robert. So, uh, as you know, Enbridge is committed to reconciliation and um, we've had some success uh, partnering with, with communities already. I think we have three partnerships working on some other ones. Uh, we're early innings on, on the one that uh, the media picked up, so I'd ask you to be patient with us. We're gonna we're gonna work through it, but uh, you can you can probably imagine uh, the, you know the types of um, you know relationships and uh, communities we're we're dealing with. So um, and there's a capital recycling element to it to it as well, right? So uh, uh, we're we're excited about it. We'll keep working it, but uh, please be patient with us. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks, Robert. Our next question comes from the line of Ben Fan from BMO. Your line is open. Hi, thanks. Good morning. Um, may, may I just go back to the uh, the comment on the solar returns being in the mid teens? Um, uh, can you can you clarify that a bit? Because we're we're hearing from industry on the renewable side that returns in solar have been quite challenging within the renewable technologies. I know you you reference panel prices, but is that is that more exclusive to Enbridge there? Well, I think, hey, thanks, Ben, it's Matthew again. I think it really depends how you're positioned. And, you know, it's it's a couple things. One is having the interconnection agreements. Um, the other is being able to navigate the supply chain. And, you know, companies like ours that are large and um, the supply chain wants to do business with us and, you know, we, we get very solid terms and conditions uh, there. Um, 
and the buyers too. These are the kinds of buyers. This is Enbridge type customers. You know, uh, these large data center type customers and blue chip corporates. Um, they're they're going to want to do business with us, and so we we think we get uh, industry best in class terms and conditions, and you know we also know how to build and operate stuff efficiently. So all that combined, Ben, uh, I'm not sure what you're hearing, but you'll see these are going to be right out of the chute. Uh, very cash flow accretive uh, and, and kick out great returns uh, over the life of the project. So, yeah, I think that mid-teens return level is uh, solidly in, in sight here. Okay, that's, that's good to hear. Um, and, and maybe on the, the regional pipelines expansion commentary, are you thinking that's, that's more lateral connections into Wapasi and Athabasca? Are you thinking more of those, those two pipes could get potentially expanded? Yeah, Ben, Colin here. So uh, generally, I'd say you know the the, the basin is is overpiped. I think there's there's a lot of competitors up there, but there are a number of bottlenecks in in the system. We we have uh, seven pipelines in, in the region, right? You'll you'll recall them, and these would be um, again horsepower, DRA, lateral, some long haul pipes in scope there too. But but de bottlenecking, a very capital efficient returns here and short cycles. So, um, you know, that production growth we talked about earlier is showing up on the main line and downstream, but also uh, at home locally. So it's, uh, it's, it's fairly imminent here. We're looking at this in the next few quarters. Okay, that's great to hear. Thank you. Our next question comes from a line of Maurice Choi from RBC Capital Markets. Your line is open. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Um, just want to stick with the mainline theme here. Um, Greg and Colin, you both mentioned that November is a portion, but may not be a portion every month uh, from here on in. Uh, maybe if you look at things on an annual basis, can you talk to any factors that would cause you to think this year's volume level wouldn't improve in 2025 and beyond, um, whether that be expectations like body prices or production shut-ins, um, just but keen to hear your thoughts on, on that. Sure, Maurice. Uh, yeah, so, you know, last, let's call it 2023's annual volume throughput through the main line was, was basically full. I think it was 3080, um, all-time record. Um, you know, this year we're trending to uh, over three, um, probably not 380, but over three. And uh, and next year, I think you should think about, you know, a comparable number. Well, we'll think we'll have more definition for you in a few weeks, but um, lots of factors. Uh, but each year, we there's turnarounds embedded in that. There's outages embedded in that. We've, uh, there's supply growth. There's There's demand growth. Um, I think the competitor pipelines are performing well, but but generally at a run rate level. Um, we continue to to find and optimize our own capacity. Our outage management has gotten uh, a lot better. We have optimizations that we're doing monthly and quarterly to add a little bit of uh, capacity. So uh, we remain pretty bullish on the utilization. Like the numbers we're talking about are you know, 98, 99% full. So there's some variation around that. I don't want to get anybody the impression that it's it's locked, but it's um, there's a multiplicity of, of supply sources. We're connected to you know, 40 different refineries. So there's a there's a diversity that that stabilizes it generally. You know, I love the question, Maurice, because uh, you know it's only a couple of years ago where people were worried, oh, how are you going to hit three million? And there we are. Continue to do that, and as you hear from Colin, you know, yeah, it's three million, and then let's uh, let's look at other opportunities down the road. So it's a it's a good question because I think a lot of people were dead wrong on this issue, and I think we've uh, proven that out come uh, different different cycles, but also even you know the arrival of TMX. Yeah, TMX ramp up definitely has been uh, much better than anyone in to be uh, to be honest. Uh, so that's good. Uh, maybe finishing up on a question on the secure growth plan. 
you know, from the prepared remarks and even from Michelle's comments, there seems to be quite a bit of growth in the U.S. and possibly even in Ontario through the integrated energy resource planning. Uh, and we obviously heard from Matthew's mid-teens return commentary just now on renewables. So, Greg, as you look across your various businesses you have today, can you speak to the trends maybe since Enbridge Day? Can you speak to the trends in terms of where you see the greatest opportunity set and separately where the risk adjusted returns are the most attractive? Yeah, sure. I mean, look, you're, you're absolutely right. I think the uh, arrival of the U.S. utilities into the portfolio put a, uh, a new opportunity set. And then, as uh, Michelle said, you know, you throw on the data center elements of that. And, and really, it's the electric uh, elements of that. These things need to be powered. Um, I think that allows incremental opportunities on the renewable side. Very careful, certain jurisdictions, quick cycle, just like GDS. So I see that opportunity there. And then let's not forget GTM. GTM's, uh, you know, uh, filling up on uh, on uh, on the power side, uh, the storage side, uh, all the LNG facilities. So as I said in my comments, there really are cyclical trends that we are in front of right now, whether it's on the power side, where it's on the reindustrialization side and nearshoring, or whether it's on the export side, which you heard the numbers and the record numbers on Ingle side, uh, and uh, you're going to see things kick up on the LNG side as well. So I would say to your, to the, your base question, we have an opportunity-rich environment, and everybody's got to conf- compete for that, even amongst the utilities. We will invest our capital in the best returning uh, utilities. If that's Ontario, it's Ontario. If it's uh, Ohio, it's Ohio or Utah. And the same thing on the gas side. You know, is it going to be BC or is it going to be the Gulf Coast or other or the Northeast? Uh, and uh, and so I think we've got we've got the um, the capacity as as Pat has laid out in the past. You know, that eight or nine billion dollars of capacity each year, and I expect we'll use it. And so it comes down to risk-adjusted returns. How quick can you take that capital, turn into earnings for shareholders, which allows us to continue to drive the dividend forward? So um, if anything, I would just say the market since Investor Day, and we look forward to coming back to you all in March, has got even better, uh, both externally for our growth, but internally for competition for capital. I like that dynamic for growth. Well, that's very good to hear. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from the line of Manav Gupta from UBS. Your line is open. Uh, good morning, guys. Congrats on a strong quarter. Uh, in early October, you announced a project which adds to your growing pipeline in Gulf of Mexico to support BP operations. Uh, can we get some more details about this project and why uh, it's a good return on investment? Yeah, Manad, it's uh, Cynthia Hansen here. Uh, Thanks for the question. We're really excited about the Canyons pipeline supporting the BP Cascita. So as was noted, it's about $700 million of investment, and and that'll be in service in 2029. What we really like is that it ties into our existing infrastructure that we have there. You may know this or may not, that we actually transport 40% of all the natural gas that comes in the in the Gulf Coast. And this um, particular field, uh, you know, we have a lot of experience and expertise in this area supporting uh, this infrastructure. It's going to tie in the gas pipeline, that 12-inch is going to tie into our existing field, Magnolia uh, gas platform. And then uh, the other oil pipeline ties into uh, the shell infrastructure. And of course, last year we announced our project there to support the ongoing development for Sparta. So it really does uh, tie in and and we're getting that uh, long-term return with really strong contracts. Uh, So the contracts allow us to get that uh, return on our investment in that first 10 year period. it's really exciting for us to continue to support that build out of, in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, what it really does also, Cynthia, as you said, you know, coming in 29, it's adding to that growth profile beyond our current three or four year look. Now you're talking about into 29 and beyond, which, you know, filling up that hopper is 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 important for us, and this really adds to that. Thank you. I'll turn it back. Thank you. Our next question comes from a line of Rob Hope from Scotiabank. Your line is open. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, want to kind of follow up on the filling the hopper uh, comment. You know, as you take a look at that eight to nine billion dollars of annual investment capacity, when you take a look at it over the next couple of years, you know, how full are you on that? Do you have a wealth of opportunities in front of you that you know you are you know we'll call it uh, cherry picking the best uh, uh, best project? And kind of where do you think you have the most room to kind of back till the uh, the capital plan? Yeah, maybe I'll start, and then maybe Pat will want to hit it. Yeah, I mean, we do have a wealth of opportunities. So it's it goes back to that issue of which there's different elements, right? So if I look at our projects in uh, in Western Canada, we've got some great projects there, but they're a little bit further out. When I look at things like GDS or some of the regional activities that Colin was just talking about or the projects we just announced, just announced on the solar side, they're coming in in 25 and 26. So uh, I think we've been able to um, pick off the ones with the best returns soonest additions to EBITDA while still being able to look at, well, let's face it, long-haul pipelines take longer to build, um, and uh, those are actually filling up the hopper out, outside of our, our numbers. So I think when you look at it, Pat, we've, uh, we're in a good spot to be able to fund all that, uh, as well as the ongoing maintenance capital, keep the uh, keep the business running reliably and with integrity. Yeah, I think we've still got a little bit of capacity in the next few years here to do things like Matthew, to do some of the stuff Matthew or Michelle's groups doing on uh, within the utilities. Uh, I think this for this third quarter is kind of a microcosm of what we should see over the next little while. The diversity of the opportunities. We've got the quick turn capital, high returning capital coming out of Matthew's green power business. We've got the starts of a bunch of real projects within Michelle's uh, that's helping to serve the data center uh, and increasing electrification. And then we've got a long-term end-of-decade type of project in Cynthia's business. So I like the fact that it's diverse from a spend profile, diverse from a uh, from when they come into service, helping to extend our growth and reaffirm the growth over 2026. So we still got a little bit of capacity in 25 and 26 to continue to do stuff and lots in the back part of the decade. So uh, real excited about the opportunities here. And uh, uh, we're going to try and pick the best of the best as we go forward. Rob, if you think about it, on our, oh, it's probably on our website from last year. I think we've got that you know, eight to nine billion dollar capacity slide. We're utilizing six to seven, uh, which leaves us a couple of billion dollars for these opportunities to come along. So that's a good one to refresh, take a look at. And then maybe to follow up there, like as you take a look at the Tuck and M and A market, uh, you know, could this be you know an opportunity to give you that uh, get you to that eight to nine billion dollars? And uh, what opportunities are you seeing uh, to be most interesting in the uh, tuck and market? Definitely something we're always watching. You know, we're we're big, so we get to see those. But they got to compete against the organic stuff. So when you've got a, a couple of billion dollars or more a year of opportunities that come up, again, whether it's distribution, renewables, uh, regional pipes, they're going to have to compete, both from an accretion perspective and from a balance sheet perspective, right? So um, I would argue in 2023, we picked off some really great assets, whether it's storage stuff, uh, um, and whether it's the utility work or some of the pieces we picked up on the renewable side, that was a good time to make those moves. So we'll be picky uh, going forward because that's helped build up the hopper at uh, really nice multiples relative to what you th I would suggest you'll see today, which will still be higher multiples as people uh, look at the value of these assets and some of those secular changes I talk about really make the value of all these assets from liquids right through to renewables more valuable than they were a year ago. Thank you. Thanks. Our next question comes from a line of Teresa Chen from Barclays. Your line is open. Hi, morning. Uh, thank you for taking my questions. Um, first, would you be able to provide um, an updated outlook on uh, the Rio Bravo pipeline project um, given that the DC Circuit vacated uh, the FERC authorization for the liquefaction facility in um, early August, does this change the timeline for the pipeline project? And what are your general expectations for next steps and uh, timeline to resolve the legal issue? Sure, Teresa, it's Cynthia again. You know, we're extremely disappointed by the DC Circuit's vacature of Rio Bravo's Section 7 certificate. Certificate and basically, you know that Rio Bravo is now held by the Whistler Parent JV. So um, we're supporting that ongoing work through our JV 
JV partnership. You know, it, it's not unprecedented here for the DC Circuit to um, get involved in these kind of permitting processes. And the FERC has had a strong track record of figuring out how to navigate this space in the past. Right now, it's not having a material impact on our Enbridge guidance. Now, the, the CEO of Next Decade, Matt Schwartzman, has said that they're going to continue to focus on keeping that project on track uh, to make sure it's uh, online to be in service in 27. And I think they've recently, both Rio Bravo and Rio Grande, have uh, filed petitions for rehearing uh, uh, to make sure that we can go forward with that. And there's been strong industry support. So a number of amicus briefs, we've supported it. Industry associations have supported that. So I think you know uh, it's really important for us to get that clarity and that regulatory approval process. Uh, and there's more to come on that. but. Uh, it's something that we're watching and supporting. Great, thank you. Um, and further east in the Gulf Coast, um, would you be able to provide an update on uh, the Venice Extension uh, Project servicing um, the plaque mines facility, uh, just given you know recent uh, concerns of delays uh, for the startup of the liquid on the liquefaction side? Can you remind us, you know, when do you expect volumes to ramp up more significantly? And uh, um, when do your commitments begin, i.e., will you be paid regardless of ramp up, you know, with this uh, year in 2024 timeline? Yeah, thanks, Teresa. Well, great news. Uh, as of today, we are flowing through our White Castle uh, uh, facilities. So that's serving about 0.8 BCF. And we think that the other two, stations, New Roads and La Rose will be in service by the end of the year. And uh, so we're already starting to receive some payments associated with those facilities. Thank you. And your final question comes from the line of Pranith Satish from Wells Fargo. Your line is open. Thanks. Good morning. Um, just going back to, to solar, so it seems like interconnect agreements, that's the main driver here for moving forward with quick return, uh, quick cycle projects with high returns. I guess, um, it can, can you talk about how much more interconnection capacity you have that could support more of these type of, uh, of projects? And then just to clarify, the, the mid-teens return um, for the solar project that you sanctioned, is, is that for the first year, including the upfront ITC, or is that the um, the IRR over the life of the project? Yeah, thanks. Um, it's Matthew again. Just <clears throat> on your last part first, uh, this is actually going to be a PTC project, not an ITC. So it's nice because it's, it's kind of more smooth across a multi-year period. So it'll provide that kind of stable, contracted, uh, reliable cash flow for many years to come and yeah, it'll be immediately accretive solidly right out of the chute and then for you know all the years forward. So that's kind of the, the overall profile and sure when we talk about returns, it's always life of project. Um, in terms of what else we have, yeah, we've got a great pipeline. Um, some of that was stuff that we had been cultivating for a number of years internally and then uh, just over two years ago, we acquired Tribe Global Energy and they had a bunch of stuff. So we've got uh, probably a couple gigawatts uh, of up to a couple gigawatts of solar with interconnection agreements. We've got great discussions going on with all the data centers, as you can imagine, and other blue chips on, on that. And then we've got about a gigawatt of wind that's interconnection ready. So, you know, overall, we're, we've got a few gigawatts still here that's, uh, that we can roll out. Again, all this stuff has to compete on returns, as we always said on renewable, and we're getting those. Um, and as long as it does continue to compete on returns and the low risk contracted model, then you know we look forward to rolling a bunch more of this out in the coming years. Yeah, I think we said at Enbridge days that we might spend a billion dollars a year on this. This is probably a bigger year than we said back then, and that has all to do with the returns we're seeing, the quick turn of that capital, and how it competes in the early years here. So I think uh, if Matthew can continue to bring these types of projects uh, with the return and, and quick turn that we like, uh, we can continue to do more of them. Got it. No, that's that's helpful. Um, and then you, you, you've highlighted um, throughout the call opportunities with data centers on the LDC side, 
renewables business. Um, I guess, what are you seeing along Texas Eastern and the U.S. gas pipeline assets uh, in terms of potential discussions with utilities that are building out gas plants or um, data centers directly for behind the meter solutions? Maybe if you could just give us an update on that. Yeah, thanks, Bernice. Uh, you know, we've said this before, we have 45% of all of the North American power generation that's within 50 miles of our Enbridge pipeline. So we are really well situated. And, and that's not just for data centers, but that's for, you know, other uh, power demand. We still have coal to gas switching, the onshore in industrialization that we're seeing. But specifically for that data center focus, we're seeing inbounds, in, you know, across that region. But also, you know, recently in the U.S. Uh, southeast, you know, we have that 0.7 BCF uh, per day of increased demand to support about 4.5 gigawatts of new gas fire generation. So we're seeing a lot of inbounds. We're working through that. I think we're continue to be really well positioned to support the data center buildup. Hey Bernice, you know, I just one thing I'd just add is that uh, it's not just opportunities. I don't want you to take it. These are actual things that are being done today. I hear a lot about opportunities, which is great. That's building it, but you know, this Duke build out is happening right now. This data center uh, connection in Utah is happening now. Uh, you know, uh, Fox Squirrel with Amazon is happening right now. So, you know, yeah, the opportunity is there, but I think uniquely to us versus some others, and that's because of where the assets are, the interconnection of the different businesses and how we can offer things, that stuff's happening now. So it's both current and opportunity going forward. Got it. That's helpful. And uh, if I could just sneak one real quick uh, last question in here with the the recent flooding in North Carolina with Hurricane Helene, um, has that had any impact on your PSNC business? Well, first of all, most importantly, it's had a terrible impact on people, right? And so that's, uh, you know, I, I'm really proud of the team there and how they've stepped up and helped the community. But operationally and financially, if you go there, no. I mean, yeah, we've we had things to do, uh, replacement, but all... Uh, all, all the uh, folks are back online now. If you need gas, we're getting gas. There are some homes that were completely destroyed, but those hooked up, but that's not a large number. But Asheville is back with terms of gas service from PSNC. I appreciate any, it. Thank any, you. Any, any of those costs would, that do come up would just go into a deferral account. Again, uh, important element of uh, regulatory structure for utilities, right? Yep. Got it. Thank you. And that concludes our question and answer session. I will now turn the call back over to Rebecca Morley for closing remarks. Great, thank you. And we appreciate your ongoing interest in Enbridge. As always, our investor relations team is available following the call for any additional questions that you may have. Once again, thanks and have a great day. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. <laughs>